Welcome to another Gamesmith Foundations video and in this episode we're going to be talking about the basic care for the most common tools that we use at our crafting table. Now I've noticed that the majority of tabletop crafting channels out there are using a tool that's called a self-healing cutting mat and I applaud this decision because this is a great tool to work with. Now if you're not familiar with this product chances are you've seen it quite abundantly but didn't realize what it is that you were seeing. Now the mats that I use on my channel are green and have that wonderful yellowed line uh, grid system on it to help me measure stuff. But I've also seen blue and gray and even yellow. Now the particular properties of these mats is such that if I cut into it with a knife of some kind that it will actually heal itself over instead of leaving a gouge behind. Unfortunately the mat degrades over time unless we maintain it. And that's what we're going to talk about first. This is a standard self-healing cutting mat. Well, they certainly don't regenerate, they do recover quite nicely from cuts and gouges made with conventional cutting tools. And as you can see, this mat has taken quite a lot of abuse. I have more than a few cuts, scrapes and blemishes on it. Restoring this mat requires a few supplies. We start with some white vinegar, at least one liter, which is slightly more than a quart. You're going to need a basin or tub big enough to submerge your mat in a few inches of water. Add about half a cup of white vinegar per half gallon of cool water. That's about 120 milliliters to 3 and 3 quarter liters of water. Make sure the water is on the cool side or the cutting mat will actually warp. I didn't measure the vinegar very accurately but I'm pretty sure it's okay. This doesn't need to be a precise measurement, I just added the vinegar based upon the volume of water in the tub. Just make sure to mix the vinegar and the water together. Next we submerge our cutting mat into the water vinegar mixture. Now we let it sit for about 20 minutes. We can add some mild dish soap to the water and with a brush vigorously wash our mat surface. When you're satisfied with the cleaning job you've done, rinse the mat off. You're going to need a towel or at least two towels large enough to put your mat in. We wrap our mat up in the towel and we let it dry. Let the mat dry for a few hours, but while doing so, make sure that it's completely flat. The cuts and gouges are gone and there's still a few blemishes on the mat, but I didn't really clean the surface that much. The vinegar and the water activate the healing properties of this material, and you should do this at least once a year in order to keep your mat in tip-top shape. Next, we're going to be cleaning up our trusty glue gun. The hot glue gun is the staple of any crafter's toolkit. Whether you have an expensive glue gun or a cheap one like mine, it cost me about $4 at the dollar store, it's going to get dirty. I suggest you plug it in and let it warm up a little bit. The heat will help remove the gunk. You're also going to need a rag in order to clean this. And you're going to need some spray suntan lotion. You simply spray the suntan lotion on the dirty areas of your glue gun and you wipe away the grime. Some smoke will likely appear if you've heated up the glue gun, but unless it's excessive you really shouldn't worry about it. You do need to be careful of the heated nozzle however, you don't want to burn yourself. And the result should make your glue gun look like new. Now hobby knives are an absolute must for any tabletop crafter and we frequently end up using this tool in such a way that they become dull much quicker than they should. However, rather than replacing the blades, we can actually sharpen them ourselves and we're going to do that next. When it comes to sharpening our hobby knives, we need a board or a block of some kind. I'm using a piece of foam board for this. We also need a fine grain of sandpaper. I suggest at least an 80 grit. This is a 90 grit paper that I found at the dollar store. I'm going to wrap this sandpaper around the foam board and use a pair of heavy rubber bands to hold it all together. Then we take our hobby knife. A lot of people call these X-Acto knives, but that's a brand name, not what the tool is called. It's like Jacuzzi or Kleenex. People refer to the brand name as synonymous with the product. All Jacuzzis are hot tub, but not all hot tubs are Jacuzzis. Wow, that was completely unnecessary information. <laughs> Make sure that the blade is securely in the handle before you begin. You want to hold your sanding surface steady and slowly grind your blade over the sandpaper. I like the circular motion so all the parts of the blade get sharpened. When you're finished you'll see a slight grey or metallic dust on the sandpaper. That's actually metal off the blade. This is a quick and easy way to keep your hobby knives sharp and ready. 
Of course, there isn't a crafter out there who isn't using a pair of scissors, and we often use this tool so frequently that we rarely notice when they become dull. But I'm going to show you a super simple way for you to sharpen your scissors yourself, and we're going to do that next. It's important to sharpen our scissors the length of the actual scissor blades. To do that, we're going to need a wad of tin foil that's been folded over multiple times. We then cut the tin foil along the longest side in order to reach as much of the scissor blades as we can. Now I've always tilted my scissors back and forth as I cut along the tin foil, more out of habit than a need to sharpen them that way. Make sure to sharpen your scissors three or four times a year. I thought I would pause here for a moment to ask that if you like what we're doing here at the Gamesmith, if you'd please hit that subscribe button, if you would hit that bell notification so you know when a new video is coming out, and if you have anything to say, if you please post it in the comments, check us out on our website at thegamesmith.org, and we're also on Facebook, Pinterest, and Instagram. Now this next helpful hint is kind of how to preserve your paints by making sure that you don't spill them and therefore wasting your money. Now this one is particularly important to me because I absolutely hate messes. Understand, I'm using the word hate to describe a mess. And I'm a tabletop crafter. Check it out. Back in my youth when I was voraciously painting plastic models, I used a lot of testers paint bottles. As a clumsy youth, I was always spilling my paint. My dad showed me what he did to prevent spills, which was to take the lid off a spray paint can. The lids have these circular walls inside in order to protect the spray nozzle. As it happens, the tester's bottle fits perfectly inside. Then my gangly fingers couldn't accidentally spill the paint. Now, however, I mainly use Citadel paints. The shades or washes actually fit quite snugly into the same lid. The smaller pots also fit quite well and remain snugly held by the lid. I've also found other lids for two products such as this cap from a mouthwash bottle work quite well. In fact, I like this lid for holding the smaller Citadel pots better, much more than the spray can lid. It also holds the shades too. Now for other paints such as those from Army Painter or Vallejo, these don't fit very snugly into these types of lids. That's okay because I always put those paints in a palette of some kind. Whereas sometimes I'll draw paint right from a Citadel pot if I haven't already put these paints into a palette too, which I usually do. Now our final topic is going to be on basic paintbrush care. And because there's such a variety of paintbrushes made from a variety of materials that come in a variety of shapes, each of those could actually have a small video made about each of them in order to properly care for them. But there are some techniques that you can apply to any paintbrush, and that's what we're going to talk about next. We're going to start with the basic construction of a paintbrush. This is obviously the handle. At the business end, we have the bristles. The very tip of the bristles is referred to as the toe. The area in the middle of the bristles is called the belly. Where the bristles are glued together is called the heel. The metal area that connects the bristles to the handle is called the ferrule. Anytime you're adding paint to the bristles, you're going to want to dip the toe in so that the paint never actually rises past the belly. Now these brushes are made with synthetic bristles, but they're shaped in a way that we want to preserve. You'll notice that these brushes have a plastic case, which is there to protect the shape of the bristles. To help preserve the shape of your bristles, you want to put a cover over the end of your brush, just like these. You can actually cover your bristles with a straw. Any straw will do, but it should fit snugly over the handle. Just estimate with a rough measurement and cut the straw to size. You'll want at least half an inch or one centimeter of space above the bristles in order to effectively protect them. Now you don't need to do this for all your paint brushes, just for those you wish to protect the shape of the bristles. Regardless of the paints you use, you'll need to clean your brushes. Now I know this might seem kind of obvious, but it bears mentioning that to clean your brush, you simply vigorously swish your brush around in cool water. For your natural fiber brushes, you should consider adding some hair conditioner to your water when you actually clean your brushes. Just mix a few drops into the water and it'll help keep your natural fiber brushes in mint condition. After all, most natural fiber brushes are made from animal hair. Then we want to drag our brush across a cloth or napkin, making sure that not to go against the bristles. Absolutely do not dry your brush by squishing the bristles with a rag. Never, never, never dry your brush that way. Again, you'll want to drag your brush over the rag. 
There is glue in the heel of the brush that actually holds the bristles in place. And drying the brush by a squishing the bristles will actually ruin their shape and loosen them from the heel. So please drag your brushes when you wish to preserve them. Next, when you go to clean your brushes, do not drop them into your water container and let them soak. Doing so will turn your shaped bristles into a disturbing mess like this and completely ruin the brush. So please don't soak your brushes by leaving them vertically in the water. Likewise, after you've cleaned your brushes, don't leave them to dry by storing the brushes upright. The water in the bristles will seep down into the crimp of the ferrule and actually weaken the glue there. It's easiest to remember, don't store your wet brushes vertically. On the other hand, once the brushes are completely dry, you can store them vertically. However, I recommend that you store your good brushes in a horizontal position. This way you never have to worry that your brush is completely dry or not. So that was our foundations video on basic tool care. If there were any tools that were not covered in this episode that you would like to see in future foundations episodes, please put those in the comments section down below and I will add them to the list. In the meantime, I'll see you at the table.